Uh, James Beverly is a longtime professor, researcher, religion, Bible scholar. In fact, the specific details, research professor at Tyndale Seminary in Toronto, associate director of the Institute for the Study of American Religion in Woodway, Texas, author of 15 books. He's taught in Asia, Europe, Africa, throughout North America. He's been an expert witness on religion in both civil and criminal trials. And his brand new book, God's Man in the White House, analyzes over 500 prophecies and statements by more than 100 prophets and top Christian leaders. You might say, I don't believe they're prophets. Well, we'll discuss, we'll discuss that, including Kim Clement, Mark Taylor, Lance Wallnau, Lana Vowser, Lou Engel, Jeremiah Johnson. Oh, I'm in the list. Michael Brown. Frank Amedia, Franklin Graham, Jerry Fowell Jr., Paula White, Stephen Strang, Robert Jeffress, Rodney Howard Brown, Jim Garlow, and James Dobson. So either prophecies or statements that have been made about Donald Trump in the White House. Is he God's man in the White House? James, thanks so much for joining us today on The Line of Fire. Thanks, Michael. Call me Jim if you want. Jim, that's that's right. We established that some weeks ago. James, in terms of formality, and Jim, personally. So, Jim, how is it that you, as a scholar of religion, as a research professor, as an academic, how is it that you get interested in a subject like this, prophecies about Donald Trump? Well, I've been I've been studying charismatic and Pentecostal prophecies for probably close to 30 years and more. I wrote a book on the Holy Laughter Movement, the Toronto Blessing, Vineyard. Uh, so the the focus on Trump just came out of that long-standing interest. Plus, I love to figure out who's telling the truth about things. So when you combine Trump with prophecies, you got two contra- controversial topics, and and there's no end of discussion about it. So about, uh, well, in 2015, I noticed that there were, uh, well, 2016 mainly, I noticed there were prophets uh, speaking about Trump, so I started collecting data, and and the result is the book you hold. I don't even have a copy of it, Michael. We can't get it in Canada for another couple of weeks. So uh, you well, have probably one of the first copies I'm hol- delivered. I'm holding it with two hands right now, flipping through the pages. Here, I want you to hear this. Flipping through the pages that you can't yeah. touch yet. Yeah, I know. That's cruel. But I'm, I'm thrilled to have it. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, first, as someone in Canada, very much in touch with the American scene, how does right. it look to you, evangelicals, Trump? I, I mean, what does it look, just from your perspective, as an outsider, but intimately involved in the research? Well, as you know, I studied uh, the fight over Mark Galley's call in Christianity Today to have uh, Trump removed from office. So I, I, I know there's a big divide among evangelicals in America about Trump. Um, Mark Galley told me in an interview that... Uh, the reaction to his editorial is the biggest storm that Christianity Today has ever faced. So there is a divide, and as anybody uh, knows, living in America, uh, Trump has is a uh, well. It, it's funny. In a way, you could say he's a divisive figure, but uh, that's compl- complicated by the fact that he's attacked by people. Um, I'm amazed, regardless of what people say against him, I'm amazed he can stand on any given day, given the unbelievable uh, forces against him from the Democrats and from the media, etc. But uh, you're right, uh, America's divided on this, and evangelicals are torn over it too. Now, as you've studied prophecy and the charismatic movement for many years, you're you're not... Uh, a hypercritic rejecting everything. You're not a blind-eyed practitioner who doesn't see faults and problems. But what's your overall analysis of contemporary prophetic claims? Have, have you seen enough to say that you believe God is still speaking prophetically, or is the jury out, or is the verdict negative? 
I would say the truth isn't always in the middle, but it often is. Uh, if you had to go between total rejection of prophecy or total belief, I'm somewhere in between. I'm, I tend to be more, on the bottom line, more skeptical. Here's why. After studying, well, one, the prophets don't claim infallibility. They make big mistakes. The charismatics pro prophets who have pushed Trump, they were wrong about Romney win winning uh, last time. Uh, that didn't happen. They were wrong about um, the Republicans taking control of both the House and Senate two years ago. So prophecy's not an infallible gift. Um, as well, um, I think a lot of the – if people read my book – I think they'll be more impressed by some prophets than others. Now, on the bottom line, I do believe that God uh, speaks to people, and I'm I'm actually impressed, greatly impressed by some of the people who claim a prophetic calling. Uh, let me mention one in particular. I know he's your friend. I met him a year ago, uh, Jeremiah Johnson. I think he's a really sincere honest, credible person. Um, and he's one of the first, in fact, I think he's the first person to get a prophetic word about Trump. So I'm, I'm a mixed person on this one, Michael. Um, one thing that helps the prophetic movement is they're, they're anchored in the basics of the gospel. So they can't by that fact, go too far astray. So I take some comfort in that. Mm. Whereas if you, if you look at some other religions who have prophets, uh, they're skewed from the start because they're not teaching or preaching the gospel. All right, so you would look at this as brothers and sisters in the Lord, some of whom are more accurate than others, but many of whom have received something genuine from the Lord. Do you think, Jim, that that there should be more accountability in our charismatic Pentecostal circles to prophetic words? Do you think that perhaps we just let them go unchecked too much? Yeah, I would say just like the non-charismatic world could get a little more open to um, maybe supernatural things, mm -hmm. the, the charismatic world should tighten up a bit. When I first started studying the wild prophecies from Kansas City and the Vineyard Movement when they were into the Kansas City prophets, I thought surely when word gets out about how wrong the prophets have been that there will be correction. Now, John Wimber did bring correction, uh, the leader of the Vineyard, but uh, overall people who were into the prophetic, uh, they, they show... Uh, they don't show enough signs of really thinking clearly about prophecy. A lot of times it's only after the fact that they announce that God told them. It's sort of like God told me that you would hold your book up, my book up on your show today. Well, one, that's perfectly logical since I'm a guest, and two, well, isn't it convenient I... I waited till after you held it up to to mention it. So now I don't think generally I don't think uh, Christian prophets are knowingly deceptive. I think sometimes they're just a little too careless. Got it. Yeah, and and I I absolutely agree. We need to have more accountability. I'm an eyewitness to the Holy Spirit speaking supernaturally to me through others, to me directly or through me to others. And so many of my friends, so many examples, it, you know, it would take th tens of thousands of books to document it. And yet, yes, those that are on the non-charismatic side can often be too closed, and those on the charismatic side can often be too open. And that's why we need the Word and Spirit, and we need each other to, together to, to, to bring the whole package in as one. So right. if, if you, uh, right now, so we are in April of 2020, and who knows what tomorrow brings with the virus and everything else and uh, upheaval in our world. But reading through these prophecies, you have now put together a collection more carefully, more extensively than, than anyone else has done. James Beverly, the book, 
God's man in the White House, Donald Trump in modern Christian prophecy. Uh, was there a general sense that he would be elected to a second term? And are there, were there general themes that seem to come through many of the prophecies for better or for worse? Um, the fact that he'd win two terms is only mentioned a bit. It's not, it's not that frequent. There's a lot of hope that he'll be elected. Um, I think the most sophisticated answer is, is from, again, Jeremiah Johnson. Uh, he's about uh, the only charismatic prophet I've discovered who, who says both positive and negative about Trump. He's generally positive, but I think in early 2018, he issued a warning to the president saying that he needed to uh, spend more time on improving his character or there would be a price to pay. Uh, but generally, the prophets love Donald Trump. They think he's God's man. Um, there's almost no limit to the positive spin, they say. And Now, some of it is so over-the-top uh, praise about him that you wonder if they're talking to the same man that most people uh, see on TV. Uh, it's just too much. Um, so that, that hurts their credibility, but that's only some of them. Right. And, and again, friends, it's not that, that Jim is avoiding mentioning names. It's that he's got a whole book with hundreds and hundreds of examples and details. So it's all in the book, God's Man in the White House, James Beverly. We come back, I, I, I want to ask him about some of the early prophecies, Kim Clement, Mark Taylor, uh, what he makes of that, and why it is that some of these prophetic brothers or sisters seem to almost idolize Trump or put him on some high pedestal. Look, I, I wrote the book Donald Trump is Not My Savior as someone voting for Trump and supporting Trump and planning to vote for him. If everything is the same as of 2020, November, voting for him then. So what is that something we should be concerned about, an overexaltation? Why might people do that? James Beverly, God's man in the White House. We'll be right back. Uh, Jim, you mentioned Jeremiah Johnson's prophecy early on. That was really uh, closer to the last election cycle. But there was a word from some years earlier by Kim Clement and then a word from Mark Taylor, uh, Kim Clement being the better known uh, with a TV ministry, Mark Taylor, fireman, who was receiving these prophetic messages. Right. Uh, where did these fit in in your overall chronology? Well, um, Kim Clement is the early – is it said Clement or Clement? I th I've heard Clement, but I'm not sure. Okay. Well, anyway, Kim was Kim was early uh, in terms of mentioning someone who could possibly fit Trump's scenario, but uh, doesn't mention Trump by name. I would love to talk to Lance Walno about his friendship with Kim. Um, the trouble with Mark Taylor's prophecies – uh, about Trump is that he thought they were for 2012, and uh, he put them away. And then when Trump was announced as a candidate in 2015, he brought them back, and he did a bit of uh, hermeneutical moves to try to say that those early prophecies from 2011 were really about 2016. The clearest uh, prophecies uh, from um, about Trump are from um, Jeremiah Johnson in July 15th of 2015. Uh, and then uh, Lance Walno got his famous um, inspiration about Trump as a wrecking ball on July 26th. And then an uh, Australian prophet named Lana Vouser got a uh, she claims that God spoke to her on October 11th that that Trump uh, <clears throat> would be uh, used by God. Uh, the reason I'm impressed by Jeremiah Johnson, Lance, and Lana is they all seem really credible people. Lana, for example, had she wasn't really interested in politics and hardly knew anything about Trump. And then she gets this word, and with um, some naivete, she 
posts it, and then she's astonished by the hate she received. Uh, she and her husband agreed to be interviewed at the end of my book, just a brief interview about what it was like to get all the uh, negativity back then. Uh, there's another example in, in 2016, a woman named Jill Steele, who says she didn't like Trump, says she heard from God that uh, he was going to use her. So those are the ones that impress me the most. Um, and uh, I, I think those are, like, intriguing. Uh, of course, I say in the introduction to my book that uh, we shouldn't, make our decisions about Trump ultimately based on prophecy. It should be about the moral and social and political issues uh, that determine whether he's the right person or not. So does he have the right views on abortion or immigration or the military or uh, whatever? Uh, so um, the prophet the prophetic angle can be a factor in thinking about it. I can mention one other thing, Michael. Go ahead. The publisher of my book is a close friend named Larry Willard. He's a, one of the major Christian publishers in Canada. Uh, he had an experience of, uh, he believes that he heard from God uh, that Trump uh, would be used by God. He was sitting on his couch and he believes that God told him to look at Isaiah 45. And he did, hadn't remember, he couldn't remember what it was about. He had to go get his Bible, look it up, and lo and behold, it was about uh, Cyrus. And then Larry says that he was convicted that Trump would be used by God. And you know what's. Now, here's, a, here's one way you decide things. I, I know Larry really well. We used to work together when he was one of the vice presidents where I taught in Toronto for 31 years. I know Larry. He wouldn't make that up. Right. If he's wrong, it isn't wrong because he's um, a con artist or a liar or a fool. He's a smart, sophisticated, great Christian leader. Anyway, those are... I find those kind of examples uh, really intriguing. Yeah, and um, and you know you mentioned that I know Jeremiah. Uh, he's uh, I, I highly respect him. He really fears God. We have talked a lot away from a stage or a camera about holiness, about fear of God, about judgment. Uh, what you see is what you get with Jeremiah. I know his his wife and and his coworkers. And uh, so he looks to me as, as a mentor in the Lord, but I, I deeply respect him. And when he got the Trump prophecy, he knew the name Trump, but he knew almost nothing about him and published the word. And next thing, it goes completely viral. He's getting calls from media around the world, from BBC to CNN. And he refused all the, the interviews. And it was not his goal to be suddenly on, on all these shows and was also shocked by the degree of flack that came against him. And and um, and then Lance Wall now. I, I know Lance. We're, we're we're friends. We don't see each other a lot, but we're friends. I respect Lance. He's he's a, a serious guy, and always coming from a different angle, kind of like a business angle, not just your typical church angle. But here he is at a meeting with other other evangelical leaders in Trump, and he feels God prompting him go to Isaiah forty five and read that out loud to Trump. And he'll be 45th president. It's like four, there, we've had more than 45 presidents. We're not realizing that you'll, if you have a president for two terms, you only count as one president. And right. he's reading the words out loud about Cyrus, even though you do not know me. And he's thinking, I'm reading these to Trump. God's saying to Trump, you don't know me, but I'm going to use you. And, and I was totally opposed to Trump at that time, militantly opposed to him. And I got on my knees one day and I said, God, I respect Jeremiah. I respect Lance, but I just don't see it. So show me if I'm missing something. That's all we can do. You know, we don't just say, oh, a prophet says something, therefore we're going to believe it. You, you watch, you look, you pray into it. But it, 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 he is such an unlikely candidate. He is so much the last one that we would have picked in so many ways. And yet, while there's been a tremendous amount of collateral damage just because of who he is, he's done a tremendous amount of good beyond what, what his predecessors have done. So two minutes we've got uh, left, and then we'll, we'll have to continue this discussion another day. 
But if you can answer in two minutes or less, why do you think so many of these prophetic people are so over the top lifting up Donald Trump? Your own opinion. I think that's their style. Uh, they're not they're not like us academics, Michael, that are prone to precision. Uh, so it, it's not a precise world. So I think they're just inclined to to be over the top in their style. Uh, I, I just think some of them should tone it down a bit. <laughs> uh, you know, you get the impression that. Uh, that, that uh, there, there's no major weaknesses in Trump that need to be addressed. Uh, in fact, that, that shows you something about mm -hmm. modern charismatic and Pentecostal prophecy. I don't think it has enough Old Testament in it. Mm. They're often really in favor of this or that without a moderating um, balance. You know, when uh, Paul Kane and Bob Jones were really big in the vineyard movement, um, you would think those two practically walked on water. Uh, and so I, I think it's just a, a human characteristic. It's, you know, and, and, and not, I guess the thing is, worried about it. yeah, OK, that, that interesting. You have that perspective, having looked at it as a believer, as a friend of the things of the spirit, but as as an academic that's going to evaluate things critically that there is human personality and the word of the Lord coming through Ezekiel used different vocabulary and sounded different than the word of the Lord coming through Isaiah or other prophets. So there is that aspect of human personality. We believe in scripture that God has fully inspired the words so that the message that comes out is exactly what he intended. But with New Testament prophecy where everyone can potentially prophesy, where everything must be more carefully tested, where you don't just have a national leader speaking a word and the whole nation has to follow like you did with ancient Israel, so you're wrong, That's it's over for you. Um, yeah, I, I think we, we often fail to factor in our theology color, colors things, our own personality right. colors things, and that's why we right. need you to know, be speaking really of Trump, careful. I think actually yeah. most yeah. people just make a basic gut reaction to they like him or, or not, and if they don't, it doesn't matter what good he does. Like, I have friends who can't stand them, even some relatives, and uh, they, they will hardly tolerate any thought about him doing good. Likewise, on the other side, the, some people go over the top for him without realizing sometimes he's he may not be the most sanctified president. Yeah, so... Although, to be fair, Michael, one thing that should be said is evangelicals who support Trump to a person, the leaders, they know that Trump has weaknesses. Right. They're not, they're not gullible about the depth or extent of, of sin in the human race in Trump and in all of them. Yeah. So what you're saying, in short, having analyzed hundreds and hundreds of prophecy statements from evangelical leaders, is that a healthy, balanced position is where we need to end up. James Beverly, God's man in the White House, an absolutely fascinating read. Thanks for joining us.